Good evening. Wow, packed house. My name is Diane Gordon. I blog about TV. I write about TV, and I'm on Twitter at the Surf Report. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about the bridge, and I know you just saw a fantastic episode. It's one of the most absorbing series on FX, which has a ton of absorbing series. Uh, I am so excited to talk to the cast, so let's get right to it. First, please welcome Thomas Wright. He plays Stephen Linder. No, no, oh, wait, wait, wait. I think that's my chair. Oh, that's your chair? <laughs> I thought you could just stand. <laughs> she plays Adriana Mendez. Please welcome Emily Rios. Oh, sure. He plays the intrepid reporter Daniel Fry, Matthew Lillard. Her character's name is Eleanor Noct, and frankly, she scares the you-know-what out of me. Please welcome Franca Potente. <laughs> and as one of the best detective teams, Sonia Cross and Marco Ruiz, please welcome Diane Kruger and Damien Bichir. Everyone's, everyone's doing well tonight? Everyone's in a good mood? Yay. Okay, good. I wanted to start out because one of the most marked differences in season two is that it features stories about how, how a lot of you are affected personally by murders. And I'm just wondering, um, how did you approach these acting challenges as you went into the new season? So, I mean, you... Marco lost Gus, his son, yeah. and Sonia is still obsessed with her sister's murder, which has led to some very interesting encounters. Yeah. Um, and then Adriana, her sister, now might be one of the missing girls of Juarez. So, Damien, you want to kick this off? Yeah, why not? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed. You, you, are you one of the writers? or? I watch, you know, you know I, everything. I love the show. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for being here, guys. Uh, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Oh, no. Orale. Ya estuvo. Um, I, I, I think, uh, well, it was, it was really difficult for me, uh, particularly, um, diving into this territory of uh, losing a son, uh, especially the way it happened. Um, and that, that uh, when we shot that, it was uh, over the course of uh, two episodes. And that's two whole weeks when you shoot that. And uh, that's, that was probably uh, the biggest challenge that I encountered because uh, my son died for two weeks, not for two days, you know. And, uh, and, and uh, to stay there, it was very, very painful. And, uh, um, and then I remember when I saw the episode, because I never knew what Carlos, uh, the kid who plays uh, Gus, was doing. And, and when I saw the episode, I, I, I was just breaking down. You know, I, was, I was torn apart because uh, I just didn't know until then, until, uh, until I saw the, the actual episode, what my son was you know, going through or had been uh, uh, gone through. And, uh, and that broke my heart, you know, it was, it was really, really tough. And then uh, I think the biggest challenge from that point on, it was step into this new season a year later and recover all those uh, uh, memories and all, all those uh, emotional uh, memoirs of um, the, uh, the, the, the events that, that, that I lived before. Uh, I remember being, you know, the first week shooting Diane and I and uh, and I told her, I don't know where the character is. I don't know where the emotions are. I, I just don't know where anything is. I looked in every door in my house, and uh, <laughs> I can't find it. And she said, yeah, me neither. It was, yeah, right? 
it's, 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 it's so hard, and uh, I, I think that's the challenge on, on TV, that, at least for me. Uh, it took me a while to get back to that point, and, uh, and then, you know, this second season, without saying much, is that this is about the emotional and uh, psychological journey of these uh, characters that uh, have been through a lot. Um, Diane, I'm just wondering, uh, since Sonia has, um, even though it's not explicitly stated that she's kind of somewhere on, that, has, that she has Asperger's, how did you approach the story about the sister and, and how Sonia acts out? Um, well, I think when shows like ours, you know, there's so many murders and there's so many people killing people <laughs> on our show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes you forget what it actually means f to a person to lose somebody. You know, we get sort of, we watch these shows and it's like, oh, it's the, the killing of the week. But I remember when I lost my grandmother, who I was very close to, and I remember, and to this day, I remember her and I remember you know, the pain that I feel and I, you know, it, it'll, it'll never be the same and even though time has passed, it's been 15 years, you know, one thing that scares me the most and always has is that time makes you forget people and that pain and memories and it's so scary and I don't know if you feel the same but every day or not every day now but Every week I look at pictures of her and I try to remember when I was a child, you know, and, and each year that passes, I feel like that memory grows a little bit dimmer. And for Sonia, who is on, on the um, autism spectrum, I think that's the only thing that keeps her going and she's never been able to overcome that. And so I remind myself every time I go to work, you know, I have this box. Every day I have this box in my office and every day I look at her and I, I force myself to remember her and that's sort of for me the driving emotional standpoint. And Emily, without, okay I should say this, without giving away a big spoiler, will we find out more about Adriana's sister? Um, oh wow, without giving spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I shouldn't have asked that, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, from the beginning of the season, um, we wanted to get into a different storyline rather than following the serial killer. So we knew tapping into border issues of Mexico and uh, El Paso, we could get into the missing women of Juarez. And the truth is, is that majority of these families don't get any closure, you know? And so we wanted to tap into stories like that. And although we obviously continue to talk about it, it's just something that, um, you'll see throughout the season that even with Adriana's character, she's going to play that, you know, that it's always kind of lingering in the back of her mind, okay. but there's just, you know, there's always gonna be questions. So then Linder mm. might not get answers either. I don't know what he's looking for. <laughs> I, 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 I have no idea. You're I just, just I just turn line? up and say the lines and hope it, and beautifully. Hope it works. And Hearing your speaking voice, how do you get to the voice you use for that character? It's just, it, it's just, I don't know how that actually happened. I don't think it's I did not it. Really a hard yeah, that's true. <laughs> put a couple marbles in your mouth. And I, I think, I think when I turned, I, already... I, I think when I turned up, I think when I turned up for the beginning of the season, I'd actually kind of forgotten how to do it. I, I, I think it's a, it's a similar deal, you know, that you get this time off. Like you're supposed to be some sort of professional sports person, except you get no preseason. You just sort of you're just sort of thrown out there, and they're like, "Go!" And you, you've you've forgotten how to do it. Um, it. I don't know how that happened. I just think it just happened. Okay. Um, I, I wasn't doing it in the audition. I don't think I'm not even convinced I'm doing it in the pilot. I think it just started to strike me as something that I thought that was really interesting, and so I started doing it more. <laughs> That's the honest truth. I think it adds a lot of shades to the character because it is a odd, it's an odd I, voice. I like that he's a genuine outsider. I don't think he's ever going to be an insider. I think it's an enjoyable thing to play an outsider mm. and to let them be there. Um, so, you know, I think the, the voice is probably something that, you know, like for me with Stephen, everything comes down to um, his childhood and his kind of backstory. I've always thought of him as a very sort of strange Freudian character who turns himself into this overarching villain of a man um, just to compensate for what an 
atrocious time he must have had as a child. So it all comes from there. I like that. That makes sense. Um, Franca, let's to oh, did someone have a mic? Okay. Let's talk about Eleanor Knocked. Um, I think my first question would be, when you were signing on to do the show, could you tell us about the conversation you had with executive producer Elwood Reed about the character? Um, I wasn't told that very much. Um, he said, okay, she's a shunt Mennonite, but we don't really see that much. She's wearing weird clothes. You're gonna have like a lot of demon tattoos on your body. I said, that's great. I have my own tattoos. Maybe we can use those. And, um, and he said, it's a very dark character. You have to really think if you want to do this. <laughs> and then he gave me two scripts and I read them and very fast. I had to like, wait five minutes and then I emailed him. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, of course I want to do this. <laughs> um, and that was not that much. I mean, you've seen the first two episodes. That was all I knew. And um, But it's always like that, I think, on a TV show, like every new script reveals new things to us. We really don't know a lot of things in the beginning. I mean, I didn't. There's something so attractive, I think, for everybody here, though, about like how operatic the gestures are in the show. Like everything's, you get to really reach for something, you know, very quickly. You're given this set of cards that might be quite hard to play, and you just have to sort of go for it, you know. Yeah, it was, it was it's super fast. There's not a lot of time. I'm very intrigued because uh, among the many bad guys on the bridge, it's like different levels of evil. It, it's a, it, and, and Eleanor Noct is just a whole nother level. There's Fausto Galvan, who is the very dependable sort of evil, you know. From yeah, but as an actor, none of that really, I mean, I just think that none of them are evil. They're just doing the, what they're doing for their own reasons. You never look okay. at a character on the script and go, oh, this guy's evil. Look at all the evil things he does. You look at the script and go, oh, I get it. I know why he's doing that. So there's a drive and a reason and there's a, a, a backstory. And I think that one of the great things now in, in, in modern cable television is that they're building really eccentric, elaborate characters that you can dig into. So it's not just the bad guy on the, uh, the body of the week show. On CSI, there's a guy that does something horrible, you show up in the third act and do something horrible, then they kill you. <laughs> like this is, you have 13 episodes and you're building and crafting and there's a reason why you're doing all these so, things. So much of it comes down to childhood in this, in this show too. I think there's, there's for, for the majority of characters in this thing, there's some deep connection to childhood, whether it's their own child or their own childhood, some, some sort of tie to it, you know, some primitive basic thing there. And that always gives you a route, like a, a fuel to, to begin from. Have any police officers approached the two of you after seeing the show? It has nothing to do with the show, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, was really, that was really directed towards Demi and Diane, but thank you, Matthew. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, TMZ. TMI. Oh. TMI. <laughs> Um, not here. Uh, okay. No, I, I, I play a cop in Mexico a long time ago, and uh, I was pulled over by uh, three different patrols, and uh, they, would, they just want to say hi and, and, and say thank you for, you know, what we're doing for the uh, police corporation. And they, da, 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 da. But not here, not that I remember. Okay. I had an immigration officer when I traveled back to the U.S. one time say, you know, lady, I see your show. The way you hold your gun, it's not Charlie's Angels. <laughs> Everyone's a critic. Okay, and then uh, Matthew and Emily, what I love about your story is you guys have become sort of Woodward and Bernstein in that you are now following the money, literally. So how much more of that do we get to see as the season plays out? Either one, either one. Oh, about nine more episodes of that. <laughs> um, you know, look, I think that, <clears throat> I think our characters become a, an instrument to help unravel the tapestry that's our show. So our show's not very A plus B equals C. 
it's a swath, it's a, a large reaching kind of story. And so we are unraveling one element of the tale as they unravel another element. And you know, we all have a different piece of the story to tell and it collides in a couple episodes from now and then it kind of you know, moves forward. But um, so yeah, so look, we are on a, a case that we care about. I mean, that's the good thing is that, look, we, I feel like, again, as actors, we are given emotional things to chase. And that's really exciting. So instead of just answering the story, we're emotionally driven to win the Pulitzer. He's a guy trying to redeem himself. He's an alcohol fallen, alcoholic fallen from grace. And so that there's a real need to answer the question. And I think, again, you know, Elwood Reed, our showrunner, and our writers, our room, have given us really kind of thick characters to dig into, and that's been an exciting thing. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> Emily concurs. Um, we were talking, we were touching backstage on inspirations, and I was wondering if we could go down the line and what inspired, what inspired you to act and maybe a couple of your biggest influences? Who would like to start? Anyone, anyone can start. Do you want to start? Uh, no. <laughs> No. <laughs> I was um, I was just talking to a friend this this afternoon that uh, he just uh, he's a filmmaker and uh, he moved from Mexico because uh, you know he wants to try over here and da 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 and I was just remembering that uh, I think the hardest part of uh, the struggle that we actors go through and uh, all this long way uh, from you know auditioning into actually getting a part and. Uh, getting the chance first to get in the room and then, you know, probably getting the chance to play a role. I, I think uh, we wake up so many mornings feeling like uh, that's that, you know, there's nothing for me. Uh, let's just, you know, forget about this. Let's uh, go back to something else that uh, whatever you, you know, think you can do. And, uh, but I think uh, the most important part in all that struggle was finding an inspiration, and, and, uh, and uh, you have to find it. I usually, you know, sometimes you find in a, in a really good book, um, some uh, uh, poetry book, or uh, in a song, or uh, in a film, stepping into a museum, just uh, traveling, or uh, uh, getting your car and drive, and then come back, or go to the, uh, I don't know, and your girl, you know, in many different ways, but you need, that was, pretty much what I needed. That was my, the gasoline that I needed to keep on going, you know, get that inspiration. And uh, you pretty much get it from uh, talented people. And, uh, and I always go back to the films I love. And uh, sometimes uh, I just, you know, watch them alone and, uh, and, and have that desire again, you know, over and over again. Yeah. Um, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I think I used to be obsessed with references and if I was to actually sit here and reel off like the performances or the films that actually really took you and you know uh, obsessed you you could sit here for hours and and talk about that but actually the only thing that when it actually began for me because I had about 10 years of unemployment um, or self-employment and working in contemporary theatre and working in experimental theatre and running my own company um, and then out of the blue um, suddenly this film work started to happen. And it only happened with really forgetting those things and stopping to give a fuck about them at all, actually. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, like you can, we can sit here and talk about Daniel Day-Lewis and we talk about Brando or De Niro, these sort of people that just like totally alter your mental landscape about what's possible in this job. Um, but ultimately I think it's just, for me at least, it was stopping thinking about that at all and putting my attention on a family or you know the people that you care about or your work um, and I probably had a unique experience because I still don't even call myself an actor some of the time I mean it's just like it's like something that I do yeah apparently I am now <laughs> but I certainly don't think of myself that way and even when I approach the job I don't think I think of myself in those terms I certainly don't have a process it's just sort of really comes down more to what you want to say if whether that's a political thing whether it's an emotional thing or some observation that you need to communicate. Yeah, sort of, yeah. I, I, you know, the funny thing is, I think that 
if you, if, 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 if somebody could magically give anyone in this room a job, whatever the fuck, yes, whatever job it is that you want, if you close your eyes and be like, I want to be on that show or on that movie, I want to win an Academy Award. The truth is, the minute you accomplish that goal, you are immediately filled with m another need for something else. So the reality is that our craft and our job, if it's about that monetary success or whatever we picture to be the successful point, the reality is if you get it, there's another horizon beyond that. There's nothing to do with the job. There's everything to do with being an artist and spending your life in the craft or spending your life working. Because no matter what, whatever that job is, if you close your eyes and you're, you accomplish it, it immediately passes and then you want something else. And so to me, the thing is it has to be about longevity and a lifetime of doing it, which goes back to there is no success. There's no success that fills you. If Tom Cruise is just as hungry and desperate as anyone in this room, that's the truth. He can feed his family a lot easier. <laughs> but he still has needs and desires and wants, and I just think it's, ins it's insatiable. Uh, that's why I'm intrigued about the issue of inspiration or where you draw inspiration from, because to try to craft a career in acting is very, very difficult. And I respect people who try it because you almost have to thrive on rejection or be able to somehow have that thick skin. And I, I can't even imagine how difficult that is. And I have worked with a lot of talent on the management side, but I can't imagine how difficult it is. So that's why I'm very intrigued by what keeps you going, you know, or what kept you going. Or, you know, that's why I was so intrigued to hear, you know, if there was a movie that inspired you or when you talk about those, those actors like Brando or De Niro or... Um, so that's why I'm so intrigued by that, because what keeps you going? Well, just being up here with these actors and everything, I know I just kind of, I didn't blow off the question, but I am in awe of the people that I'm up here with. I understand that um, they have a resume built up that I could only wish to ever attain. And, um, you know, the, the writers, and we do our table reads, or we do, you know, Matt loves to over-rehearse, which I love, but, you know, they're always asking me, like, do you have an input? Like Matt's changing the lines all the time, and you know, talking Don't to the writers. Don't change the lines. You, you, he, he takes my lines, <laughs> and, do not take and your it line. works for the scene, and it makes sense. You know, it really does. <laughs> I love you. You know, I do. And he does take my lines all the time, and I, I can't I look him in the eye, and say. I'm like, hey, it's fine. I understand you delivered a lot better. Okay, it makes sense. <laughs> but I, I think what going back to what Thomas was saying is that the minute you stop paying attention and stop really, I mean, not paying attention it's just it, stop worrying about like what's next yeah stop worrying about the results I mean what really makes you happy and um, getting into this business I was you know shopping at a mall and a talent scout handed me a card and was like hey do you want to do this and I really didn't I wanted to play professional basketball embarrassingly enough you know I'm not tall enough I'm not good enough it's just you know it didn't work but I mean it, yeah, it didn't work yet yet I'm officially unemployed you know the show's over for me so like you know I could look for another job now but um, it's, it, it came from a, a place of just being in that moment and being present and being in the scene and being with your characters and, and listening, you know? I, I listen to Matt all the time and I, I learn from him because I work with him, you know, uh, more than everybody else. And so when I'm up here, it may seem like I'm not saying anything, but it's just because I'm learning, you know? And it's always about listening and, and understanding that these people have, you know, all been here for a lot more years than I have. And you I, I'm just, I wanna learn. You are Breaking Bad, girl. Oh, you are Breaking you. Bad. <laughs> And by the yeah. way, and to continue to give props to you because the character you're playing, Adriana, it, is a reporter. She is out, and she is out to her family and openly gay, and that has gotten a lot of, of notice. And I, you did a great interview with uh, After Ellen. Thank you. Which was just so refreshing and very honest. And I'm just wondering, what's been the reaction, you know, from the LGBT community when you know you've just encountered people walking around? Well, I haven't really. I mean, you know, it was just a week ago. So, um, but from what I've seen, it's been very, very supportive. And again, it was one of those things where I stopped paying attention to it and I don't care because it really doesn't bother me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was one of those things. Again, it was just happened to be a nonchalant. It wasn't a question. It was just like, this is a matter of fact. I wanted to talk about the character that I came from, a, you know, from a personal perspective where I respected it and I understood it on another level that 
I wanted not just the LGBT community to understand that you know I came from you know that personal right. space, but I wanted everybody else to know that this is how I understood the character and this is why I played it to you know to that extent. So that was the difference. I love that it's very matter of fact in the show. It is. It just happens to be incidental. So exactly. you know exactly. And Franca, I'm just wondering. Um, I know the bridge kind of shoots. It almost feels more like a, a feature film than a TV show. But have you enjoyed the experience of making a television show? Oh yeah, it has been ages since I worked on a movie. To be honest with you, so um, I I love that I I uh, I love instant gratification. I'm very impatient, so if I have to wait around for eight hours and then maybe I get to go home because something didn't work out, I hate that. So I love that it, you know it's like 20 minutes of lighting or something and then go. Um, I I don't have the endurance especially where I'm right now in my life. I'm constantly exhausted. I have a small child. I don't sleep much. I can't wait around forever and then still be 100%. It's difficult for me. I'm an old lady now. I can't do that. <laughs> so well, That's not true. Um, but, I, okay. No, no. I, but I really appreciate the momentum and the pace um, personally. Everybody's different in what they need. I like that they can make things happen just as brilliantly in a shorter amount of time. I really do. I think it's and great. as you've continued to shoot, what's been the most intriguing part of the character to you? Uh, I don't know. It's funny. Maybe because she's so weird and different. I don't... I don't know. I, I don't look at her constant. I don't step outside her or, m or myself and look at her and be like, oh my god, she's so crazy. Uh, it's maybe just reactions of people that I know that have stuff to say about what they saw. Where I'm like, oh, that's funny. I realize I've never done anything like that, but I'm very pragmatic. Like, um, I just like to, if we're still kind of talking a little bit about what inspires us, I, I'm, a, I'm a really classic actor. Like, when I'm working with a director and they change every week, I'm like a dog. Like, so you throw me a bone and I'm just eager to run and get it and bring it back. That makes me happy. I want to make the director happy. I want to have a good time. I want to, I want to make the p colleague happy that I work with. I want to see in their eyeballs that we kind of have some kind of understanding. That makes me happy. It makes me unhappy if we both feel like, ah, we don't get this scene, I don't understand this, oh, it's okay. Well, moving on, oh, we didn't really get it, oh, whatever. That's the worst. But I live too. I mean, you know, it's not the most precious thing on the planet at the end of the day, I think. I've come to after like 20 years of doing this. I love it and I want it to be 100%, but it doesn't always happen. Everybody cares a lot though on this show. I think that's the thing though. You really get the feeling when you come out to set, you're working with somebody who you don't normally work with. And it's worth remembering on a show like this that a lot of us don't see each other. Um, very much. On set this year, I think I only ran into Matthew twice. You know, you never see each other. We all exist in these kind of parallel worlds, occasionally bump up against each other. But there's a feeling of real focus on the show that I always uh, appreciate. People aren't just sort of standing around before you roll, chatting about fucking whatever, you know, just, just rambling at each other. There's a sense of focus. And there's also, also a, a real clear sense of challenging the writers, actually, that I've come across challenging the writers and challenging the directors in a kind of wanting to have a little friction there. Um, and the writers are very responsive to people when they, when they bring them issues about their character or ideas that they've had, inspirations. Elwood is extraordinarily open to it. I mean, he'll literally say, what do you want to happen this season? What do you want, where do you want your character to go? What do you want to see? You know, it doesn't always happen, but the conversations are always ongoing. Um, we're going to go through a couple of questions from the audience. Um, first, uh, for the cast, what would you consider your big break? Demian, why don't you start? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I've been through, you see, I began acting when I was three. It is, it is, it is real, it's a true story. Uh, my father, he's a theater director, my mom is an actor, and uh, we grew up in the theater with them in Mexico. And, uh, so I've, I've had like many different uh, times and uh, you know, crucial moments in my life as an actor ever since I was a kid. And uh, so I kind of divided into Spanish or English. And I think, uh, I remember I got here 1989 and uh, 
uh, just, 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 you know, with this idea of uh, doing something differently because uh, I was, I was, uh, I grew up doing a lot of theater in Mexico and, uh, and I just wanted to give myself a break. So I came here in, in search of that, you know, some other type of uh, uh, life experiences for my actor. And, uh, and then I find myself, I find myself in, in those experiences. And, uh, and I remember that I had to close everything in 1994, just uh, five, five, five years after that, because nothing was happening. And I thought, ah, this is it, you know, let's go back to Mexico and continue, you know, the, the, <laughs> the ride over there. And uh, that was that. And, uh, and then seven years ago, I, 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 I remember I was uh, very happy and calm, and then I, I had this weird thought that I was going to become 80, and I would ask myself, what if I try, you know, I had tried again, you know, like probably harder or try again. And then I moved again to Los Angeles. And then I went to this audition. Uh, it was a general meeting with Mary Vernieu. And whenever I finish a, a, a project, I let everything grow, hair, beard, and blah, blah. so I had this long beard. And uh, she kept looking at me and she said, can you, can you stay and uh, can I put you on tape? Are you good with a uh, Cuban accent? I said, oh, claro que sí, chica, tú de qué me estás hablando? Si yo, <laughs> si yo soy cubano, tú sabes lo que yo te digo, tú. He said, oh, that, that's great. Sorry, honey. Um, yeah, let's, let's uh, put you on tape. And that was Che, the, the, the films that we did with Steven Soderbergh. Steven Soderbergh and Benicio del Toro. And, uh, and then I was, I was a jury at the Ibiza Film Festival, and they, got me, they, they called me at 5 in the morning, and I said, how soon can you be in New York to meet with Steven Soderbergh because he wants you to play Fidel? And uh, I think on this side of the border, that was that. Okay. That was the uh, big uh, thing. Everything changed after that. Okay, Diane. Um, I think it's like two moments in my life. I feel like the first time somebody said, yes, you got the job. Okay. I sort of, I, I took the batteries out of my cell phone because I felt like they were going to call back and say, you know, <laughs> sorry, it was a mistake. <laughs> I remember that. And I still feel like that sometimes. And then the other moment is the first time I said no to a script. I remember like being in a cold sweat because, you know, you, when you start out, you don't have choice, you know? You're like, I literally you do anything you want, you know? You wanna be a puppet? Sure, I'll be a puppet. <laughs> and I remember like getting a script and like, no, it's an offer and it's this amount of money and uh, saying, no. <sighs> I felt like, you know, I felt like I was ne my punishment was no work for 10 years, but that felt like I'm a working actor. I can say no to something as a big break. <laughs> Brian. Go, oh, sorry, Matthew, go no, ahead. I'm just looking forward to that moment. <laughs> 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 Did you feel good? <laughs> 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 Did you feel pretty? <laughs> I will say that. Can I? Go ahead. Jump in the Go ahead. Oh, no, no, you go. No, 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 no. I don't know. Um, I. I think my first break was Run Lola Run, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, which was awesome because I remember when we made that film for little money in 30 days in Berlin, stealing shots that we had no permit for and all this stuff. It's crazy, crazy to think back that movies were made like that. Um, we thought it would be like an art film that would show at midnight on Arte, which is an art channel in, in Germany. <laughs> And um, what happened with the film was, for me, was like Christmas every day. And the presents kept getting bigger and kept coming. It was crazy. It was awesome to travel with it. And so that experience, other than, you know, that it opened doors work-wise for me, you get an agent and all this kind of stuff that happens then, was, uh, I think, just the liberation or the, the, this awesome experience that work actually can get you around the world. and and can actually reach people, even though it's in German. That was kind of, I didn't expect that. I didn't know that beforehand, maybe. Um, so yeah, I think that was that. It was 18 years ago. 
Matthew? Yeah, I think that the biggest point in my life was when I was in acting school and you start walking around calling yourself an actor. That's half the battle. Half the battle is walking into a room and being proud to call yourself an actor because there's that fear of like everyone calls, everyone thinks you're full of shit. Oh yeah, what movie you been in? And you're like, I'm an actor. And you're like, oh really? I haven't seen you. Really. Fucking <laughs> suck it. But the idea of like going to acting school and discovering it's it, the empowerment of calling yourself an actor okay. is huge. My biggest break was I was in Ghoulies. Why are you laughing at me? I see you. One and two on the call sheet. Don't laugh. <laughs> My biggest break as an actor was I was a non-union extra in a movie called Ghoulies Go to College. <laughs> it was awesome. And I was number, um, I was uh, 18 days. I was this non-union extra. And I, every day I said five consecutive words to give my Taff Hartley. <laughs> want to go do homework? No! And that would be in rehearsal. And then they're like, great. And Lillard, don't say anything. And on the last day, they, I knew that they had to do a reshoot of the entire first day, and I was in every shot. And I said, I am not coming to work unless you make it worth my while. And the second AD was like, uh, are you sure you want to say that? I'm like, yes. And then the first AD called me like three hours later. And, so, and I was 19, I'm 44, so it was a long time ago. So there's no cell phones. So the first lady called me, left me a message. Called me when you get this message. I got home, I, got, you know, I called and said, hey, I, I got this message. Say, don't call, don't, you're not coming in unless we make it worth your while. Like, what is that? I said, I just, I really want to be Taff Heart lead. I want to be, I want to join the union, please. And they're like, yeah, that's not happening. Click. The... Um, UPM called me and called me up and cursed me a storm and basically said, who do you think you are? You will never, you will never work in this town again. You're an extra. How dare you? We've given you 18 days of work where you made $45 a day. How dare you? How dare you? You will never click. And I'm like, oh, well, there you go. And I went to rehearsal, and I came back, and I got a message on my machine from the executive producer. said, whatever time you get in, I want you to call me. So 1 o'clock in the morning. And this is back in the old day. Like, if you hit push, record, and play at the same time on your little tape, it records it. So I recorded it. I'm like, this is me getting my SAG card. <laughs> hey, this is Matt. Did you really say that? I did. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be a jerk. That was a good move. Show up tomorrow, and we'll give you your SAG card. Yes. Um, Thomas Blackmail your way to the top. That's the moral of the story. Just <laughs> F them. Uh, mine was quinceanera. You know, it's my first. I, I was non-union. It was a non-union film. We shot it in 18 days. I thought all movies were shot in 18 days. I thought everybody, every DP just handheld, you know, the camera, and that's the way we shot. I thought everything took one or two takes, and that was all the time you had in the world. Um, but yeah, that was basically my big break. Um, I was a producer and a director and a designer, really, in theater, and I was cast by um, Kate Blanchett and someone else to play uh, the lead in a show called Baal for Sydney Theatre Company, which was me naked in the rain for an hour and a half, oh. surrounded by like eight women who were also naked in the rain for an hour and a half. And J Jane Campion... Were the casting criteria. <laughs> and um, my, uh, there was a girl who was one of those eight girls and four weeks later she was pregnant and she's now the mother of my child. And Jane Campion saw that show and cast me on top of the lake. Um, so, um, that sort of, was a criterias? bit of a life, life changer. <laughs> what were the casting criteria? <laughs> Don't ask. And with that, and with that, we're out of time. But everyone, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you to the cast of The Bridge. Thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. We'll see you next time.